Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So let's uh, start off where we, uh, uh, let's pick up the thread where we left off. So last time uh, we were uh, talking about uh, the uh, case of uh, uh, so online learning with, with uh, so-called full information uh, and we came up with these uh, natural kind of uh, exponential weights penalization algorithms to basically try and select actions so as to minimize the regret. Okay, so we saw what regret was and, and so on. So now we'll come to a slightly, uh, not a slightly actually, a fundamentally more challenging problem which is how to try and optimize your choices when you have much lesser information that you can get. Okay, so you'll see the difference uh, very soon. Okay, okay. So let's consider uh, uh, a simple game where you're trying to basically compete with n experts or n actions. So think of, so think of n actions. So think of the uh, experts as just an action that you can choose at one time, right? So it, every time you have a choice between n alternatives, right? You have to play one among several actions, right? Uh, so at each time, so you start at time equal to one in discrete steps. Okay. Uh, the environment essentially picks, essentially, so each action suffers a certain loss uh, in a given period of time. Okay, so the loss suffered by action i at time t is a number, scalar number lit. Okay, you can think of this as a loss that each action suffers by predicting, uh, I mean, it's just a number. Okay, uh, so these losses are set by the environment for all the all, all the actions possible at, at a given instant of time. They're not revealed to the forecaster. Then the forecaster basically has to pick an action i of t, okay, which is one among the n actions. So you have to basically decide as an agent which action to play at time t, okay. And the action that you play essentially you will get the loss which corresponding to that action, okay, at that time. You will suffer that much amount of loss in that time step. And uh, then you basically get to see, uh, essentially you get to see, so since you suffer that loss, you are allowed to see how much loss you suffered, okay. So suppose there are 10 actions, right, at each point in time. Uh, and at time equal to 1, you chose action number 5, right, to play, right. So, you will essentially get the fifth component of the vector, that is the loss of all the actions at time 1, okay. So, this is crucial, uh, this makes the problem very challenging because uh, uh, if you recall in the full information setup, we could in fact compute the losses that every expert or action suffered in, in hindsight, right, after looking at the outcome, right. So, here you are not looking really at the outcome which helps you to determine all the losses or the exact performance of all the experts in that round, but you only get to see exactly what you pick, okay. And this is important because it connects to a lot of problems in uh, online, uh, let's say, recommendation system. So, uh, suppose you are a user that is browsing on a website, right. The recommendation system, let's say, has the capacity to show you one advertisement, right. And there are certain types of advertisements that it can show you. Think of all those as actions, right. So, when it shows you a particular action, uh, you basically decide to click on it or not, okay. You, you, you click on an advertisement or not, right, indicating sort of uh, your utility for that advertisement, right. And the feedback that the system gets it's, is only about the ad that you showed it, right. You will not be able to observe consequences of actions that you did not take, okay, in hindsight. There is no way you can, you can essentially find out how uh, the, the, the relative worth of every action in a given time slot, in a single time slot, unless, I mean, so, uh, unless you actually explore across actions across time slots, okay. So, there is an element of exploration that is necessary here, okay. So, if, it, if you got to see basically the losses L i t for every i at time t after you made a decision, then that would correspond to the full information setting, okay. So, uh, just to take an example uh, uh, sample path, right. So, at time 1, let us say uh, you just decide to pick go with action number 1, okay, right. So, you know that a certain uh, vector of losses was chosen, right, uh, in, by, by, by nature, but you only get to basically see what loss you suffered, right. So, uh, time goes along the uh, horizontal axis and you essentially just get to observe the coordinate of essentially this vector that you chose at, at a given point in time, okay. So, at time 2, let us say you uh, decide to pick action 2, you only get to observe this component of the vector, okay. At time 3, let us say you, you again want to play action 1 you get only, uh, you suffer this much loss, okay. So, this is exactly the, the, the model, the, the feedback that you get, that you are allowed to get in the sequential kind of game, okay, which is, so this kind of partial information about the vector is called bandit information, okay, right. And you can still think, you can still talk about minimizing a notion of regret. So, the regret here is similar to what we saw earlier, 
So consider any possible setting of essentially all these losses, right? Consider any possible uh, way to set all these losses ahead of time, and uh, uh, with 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 this exact manner of being uh, of uh, revealing the losses to the agent, right? Corresponding to any such allocation, you want to try and compare uh, the total loss earned by your algorithm versus uh, the minimum loss that any particular uh, one action across the entire interval of time suffers. Okay, so what you want to do in some sense is uh, you want to compare the sum of all these numbers, which is exactly what your algorithm accumulated, versus uh, basically the row sums in, in this matrix. Okay, so uh, the row sums essentially are sums of all the losses for a given action across time. Okay. You will still not know the value. Yes. You'll only know one plus three. So the, the the essentially the state or the history that you accumulate is only essentially one coordinate per time. You will not be even able to see this, okay? Uh, but you still can actually uh, uh, maybe in some sense hope to compete with the best possible. Uh, so what would happen if uh, basically only stuck with action one or only stuck with action two or only stuck with action three for the entire duration of time? Yes. It's very, very close to setting a reinforcement. So all that, uh, all that is required to sort of turn it into something that looks exactly like reinforcement learning is some assumption that these losses are being generated uh, according to some probability, probability distribution. Okay, and we'll discuss this exactly when we move on to the uh, stochastic setting of, of. So there are uh, problems called stochastic bandits, which essentially are uh, things that become reinforcement learning problems. Are there losses set by environment Sorry. So it, uh, this is uh, it depends on what you mean by the word stationary in this sense. Are they on the time or they can be any arbitrary sequence. I am not telling you anything about how you can generate these, but uh, you can definitely. So I will. We will uh, look at uh, strategies that can actually uh, uh, cope with any kind of setting of these numbers. Okay. So I should probably make one thing clear: is that in all these uh, uh, discussions, you should just imagine that this uh, matrix of losses is uh, set ahead in time. So one way to think about it is you, uh, so nature basically writes down all these numbers ahead of time and then reveals it to you incrementally depending on what you ask for, right, or what you play, right. There are other uh, uh, possible uh, models of uh, interaction where the environment can actually react to what you did, okay. So that is called an adversary of a different kind, okay. It's an adversary which is reactive as opposed to uh, an adversarial setting of losses here that is static, okay. So this uh, allocation of losses uh, a priori doesn't really depend on what the algorithm asks for, but you can also imagine settings where the adversary might actually conspire to sort of give you the worst possible time, right, uh, during your uh, operation. So those are things that we will ignore for the time being. So it's just it just helps to think of any possible setting of these losses, right, fixed beforehand. This one, yeah. ah, so it's a yeah. So it's a sort of a, it's a, it's a it's a good question, but the answer is rather trivial. I mean, so it is not possible to compare against uh, strategies that can pick essentially the best element in each column. Okay, so in order for you to try and compete with essentially picking the the, the lowest element in each column, uh, so ideally the, the holy grail would be if you were somehow able to predict the minimum element in each column and just play that action. But that's not really possible. You can show that it's impossible given the information limitation that you have. You cannot observe uh, an element, uh, you cannot observe any vector beforehand, right? So uh, that is basically impossible. So you have to compare with a reasonable notion of uh, uh, performance, which is either comparing the best possible individual row of uh, losses suffered by each individual action, or in some cases, you, may, you can even enlarge the set of uh, strategies that you can compare with by, let's say, comparing against any strategy that, that can switch between actions a finite number of times or, or a small number of times, okay, but you can't allow arbitrary switches, okay, then the problem just becomes, you will get regret that is always linear, okay, you will not be able to really learn anything, okay, so that's a limitation of course of the online uh, information model, okay, is that clear? Right, so, uh, so this, this, the outside supremum is just uh, saying that you consider the maximum possible uh, value of this term over any setting of these coordinates uh, of all these vectors, right? 
and uh, this is the loss accumulated by our algorithm and this is the least possible loss accumulated by any single arm in hindsight. So this is a notion of loss, best possible loss in hindsight, right? When you play the whole game, look back at the past and then figure out which possible arm in hindsight had the best possible loss and you want to be as close to this as possible, okay? Right, so if you are able to minimize this, you are in some sense learning something implicitly. You are actually trying to learn uh, to stick to the best action where the best action is defined in this sense. Right? right so what are what is what is hard about this game? Right. So of course uh, you can, with a little bit of thought, convince yourself that uh, if you have a deterministic algorithm to play this game, right, without any form of randomization across actions, uh, then no algorithm can get uh, uh, regret that is better than sublinear, uh, better than constant times uh, time, because you will always you can always construct bad sequences of loss vectors such that if you have a deterministic algorithm, let's say the, the algorithm starts by picking one at time one, uh, you can always put the put a very high loss. You can always construct a sequence that has very loss, high loss on, on, on time one. And uh, then once you fix that action, then you know what you know exactly what the, what action the algorithm is going to ask for in the next time. Then you can again go and design a really bad sequence for which the algorithm suffers a large loss and so on. Okay. So you can always without randomization you can't hope to uh, you know, reduce your uh, regret. So, in some sense, you need uh, you need to use randomization in your algorithms fundamentally and inherently, in order to somehow induce exploration across actions, in the hope of trying to reduce your regret, okay, or keep keep it low. Right. So, one more issue, of course, is the fundamental issue of a lack of information. Right. So, in the in the full information setting, uh, you could essentially observe the losses that all the experts or all the actions suffered, right? So in some sense, the amount of information that is being revealed to you is uh, of size n. You observe n bits of information, one, one for each action. You can observe the loss of every action. Whereas here, you can only observe one unit of information, that is for the action that you chose, right? So there is a fundamental difficulty of, you know, your, your, your rate at which you can gain information is very limited, right? So would this, how, would, how does this impact how fast you can learn or how fast you can minimize regret, okay? It's not clear. So you can't directly run an algorithm like, so recall the exponential weight scheme, right? You basically, at each instant of time, you know how bad or how good each expert or each action did. You can just go and penalize every expert or action by uh, the loss that it incurred, right? And you can just carry on this game. But here you don't even know what losses other experts suffered, right? So you, there's no explicit way to carry this forward. Right? So this is where uh, some nice tricks come into the picture. So, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you were there in Sanjay's talk, but uh, uh, if you are allowed only a single coordinate access to a vector, you can still build uh, an unbiased estimate of the entire vector. Okay, so I tell you that there is a vector with 10 coordinates and you can un only sample one coordinate of the vector. You can still, in, in a randomized fashion, uh, give me an estimate for the entire vector, which actually is going to have uh, as expectation the same for the actual vector. Right? So, does anyone recall how to do this? Right, so here is, okay, so suppose you could do this, right? So suppose there is some way to build a blackboard, to build uh, some scheme that uh, given access to only one coordinate of the entire loss vector of all the losses of the experts, uh, helps you to build some kind of reasonable unbiased estimate of, of the entire vector, right? So once you have an unbiased estimate, it's at least a reasonable estimate of the entire loss vector, then you can just pretend that you're in the full information setting, right? And you can just feed all these estimated losses uh, to an algorithm like, exponential weights which penalizes these experts by those appropriately estimated losses, right? Right, so uh, yeah, before presenting the algorithm, so the idea behind trying to build an, uh, the so idea behind how you can build an estimate of the entire vector is as follows, right? So suppose you have 10 coordinates to sample. I allow you to only sample one coordinate, right? Just start with, let's say, your favorite distribution. Let's say it's a uniform distribution across the 10 coordinates, right? Uh, sample any one of the coordinates randomly with probability 1 by 10 and when you get the value of that coordinate just uh, divide by uh, just multiply that by 10 okay and the estimate of the vector that you return is 0 in all the other coordinates where you didn't sample and 10 times the value that is that you that you sampled in the coordinate that you decided to sample okay uh, is, is it uh, is it clear that this actually gives you an unbiased estimate of the entire vector Right, because if you look at the expected value of a particular coordinate, that particular coordinate will be sampled with probability 1 by 10, 
right? So with probability 9 by 10, it will have a value of 0. And with probability 1 by 10, it will have a value of 10 times the real value, right? So the expected value still turns out to be the actual value of the coordinate, right? So it's just a simple trick to try and estimate an entire vector given only single sample axis. Okay. And this idea was crucially used to uh, essentially give a complete solution to this uh, the, the uh, setting of regret minimization, the bandit setting, uh, with this uh, algorithm which is based off of uh, the exponential weights algorithm. It's called EXP3. So EXP3 is basically X, three, three EXP, so ex, exponential weights with exploration and exploitation, so three EXPs. Okay. So, uh, so the, 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 the intuition behind this as follows, you still have the same learning rate parameter, eta. Uh, at the beginning, you essentially uh, initialize a uniform probability for, uh, essentially, you have a uniform probability distribution for playing across all actions. Okay, This is the same as setting weights for all the actions and then normalizing and building a probability distribution. Right? At each time, you randomly, you randomly sample an action to play according to the current probability distribution that you have, which in the beginning is uniform. Right? So, it is the current action at time t, which is sampled uniformly according to the current distribution across actions. The moment you play an action, you basically receive, you get to see its loss, L, that is the loss at coordinate it at time t. And then you just set the loss estimates for all the other actions uh, as 0. And for the current action that you sampled, you essentially set it to be the loss that you saw divided by the probability with which you actually sampled the action. Okay, so. Uh, in the simple case I explained, you could start with a uniform distribution and sort of divide by 1 by 10, right, in, for 10 coordinates. But if it's any other distribution that you used and got a sample, you have to divide by es essentially the probability with which you sampled that particular coordinate, right. So that will still make it into an unbiased estimate of the entire vector, okay. Is that clear? And once you have this estimated loss, which I denote by L tilde, right, so this is the algorithm's estimate for the losses of all the actions at time t you can just go and update the probabilities by hitting them with e to the minus eta times the estimated losses right? because that is exactly what you have access to okay and this is the same as this is the same as the exponential weights update only with estimated losses instead of real losses okay is that clear it turns out this is a really this is something that actually works you can in fact show that it gets you uh, very similar regret guarantees like what you saw earlier so there is a log n n is the number of actions which was the number of experts earlier so log n over eta plus uh, eta n over 2. Okay, so the, the only uh, difference here being that there is an extra n term here. Okay, so there is an extra number of experts term sitting here. Earlier there was only a t times eta, okay, in the full information setting. So in some sense you are already seeing the price of uh, bandit information coming into the picture, right. So you, you can't, uh, so there is a blow up of sort of n in here, okay. I mean if you actually optimize for the best possible value of eta, so I should just say that the proof uh, of how you show this is again very related to uh, how you uh, prove the regret for uh, the, the full information case for uh, the exponential weights algorithm along with the fact that you are using sort of now inaccurate or estimated values of these losses. But uh, there is a nice way to sort of control the variability of these estimates. Okay, So it, it's fundamentally the same idea, just requires a little more careful accounting. Okay. So if you tune this eta optimally uh, ahead of time, you can get uh, something like square root t n log n. So this is where this extra n term comes here. With full information, you would just have square root t log n right, over 2 or something, right, if you recall. So this is really the price of bandit information. There is an extra square root n term, uh, which is of the order of the number of actions. So intuitively, you are observing much less uh, information per, uh, per round. So that has to translate into sort of a slower rate of learning. Okay. But it's still nice because it's growing only a square root in the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the length of the time horizon. Right? So this is still uh, great given that you only had individual coordinate axis. You're in the bandit setting. Okay? So if you just yeah, compare this with the full information setting regret, uh, you actually suffer an extra factor of square root n. Okay? So which is typically the, the price of uh, being able to get only bandit information. Uh, right, so I, I guess I will, uh, so for the non-stochastic setting, I will uh, stop here. Uh, there are some more items that I would uh, have liked to cover, but maybe I will, they will show up again when we discover, uh, discuss the story in the stochastic uh, bandits uh, world, okay. So I leave that to the next uh, set of slides. Okay, so this is basically uh, 
sort of a separate uh, the, the second lecture essentially on uh, stochastic bandits with uh, sort of how, how can you learn with uh, stochastic or distributional assumptions uh, and you will see similar kind of bandit uh, problems okay so online learning with in a stochastic world so to speak right so again what's a multi arm bandit okay this is not a multi arm bandit <laughs> okay it is also a multi arm bandit but not the one that we are interested in so uh, just to give you some bit of background i mean the term you might have wondered why the term bandit is used to to to, to define problems where you can access only sort of uh, uh, you can only observe consequences for actions that you take right so it turns out that the historical reason for this is uh, so bandit is a, actually a special type of uh, gambling machine in a casino okay so long ago they used to have these slot machines in in casinos which were actually called bandits the reason it is called a bandit is basically it essentially eats up your money okay if you they are rigged in such a way that uh, on an average you will essentially lose money okay but assuming that you have a bunch of uh, n uh, slot machines in a casino uh, each of them could essentially have a different uh, probability of uh, you winning at that game right uh, it's in some sense a randomized machine and uh, let's say each of these machines gives you returns at a different at different rates which you don't know about a priori right so the the game is essentially how would you try and play these arms uh, uh, these slot machines to try and maximize your reward okay and that is essen essentially the motivation for studying uh, other problems which have similar uh, objectives right and then you can call all of them as derivatives of bandit problems right right so let's consider a stochastic version of the multi arm bandit game you have n actions right think of these as the same n actions that we saw earlier okay these can be arms of a slot machine of diff of uh, every every action can be an individual slot machine which you pull and then you get some reward with some probability right uh, they could be for instance in online advertising you could have each arm being let's say uh, so let's say you are a news advertiser you have one slot uh, worth of news content that you can serve up on a web page and you have different categories of ads uh, sorry different categories of news articles that you can sample from right so let's say action 1 is let's say sports news action 2 is entertainment news action 3 is movie news and so on, right and let's say you are interacting with a particular user and you don't know essentially what the user's preference is for various categories of news articles a priori so you want to essentially try and discover interactively uh, which kind of categories work best with a given user right so whenever you select uh, and place an item from a particular news category and give it to the user the user has some intrinsic preference and the user will essentially either read the article with some probability or discard the article right so it's a probabilistic model okay for generating rewards or observation so think of n actions in an abstract sense right they could be ads to show news articles they could be frequencies to transmit in a communication system or so on right <coughs> so each arm is associated with an unknown probability distribution right we will represent the probability distribution by theta i uh with some associated mean okay so think of each arm as as giving you a reward distributed according to some distribution and with some average or expected reward right so for the whole talk it suffices to think of each arm being uh, just a binary reward a binary random variable with some probability of success okay <coughs> yeah so just think of each reward distribution as being a bernoulli distribution which has a sim sim simple single parameter <coughs> right so at time 1 let's say you, at every time you have to pick one action so let's say at time 1 you pick action 2 it gives you some reward uh, at time 1 which is distributed according to the distribution for that particular action okay the probability distribution from it just randomly and independently generated and given to you okay so each time you pick one action and you accumulate some reward uh, whenever you pick uh, whatever uh, the associated action and you play this for some time you play this let's say for capital t number of rounds as before okay and you could be interested in several things so uh, if you are a gambler in a casino you could just be purely interested in the maximum reward that you make right so since the rewards are being randomly generated i could think of trying to collect as much reward on average as possible right in given an interval of t plays of this game right uh, this is exactly equivalent to trying to ma minimize a notion of regret right so in some sense uh, the best thing to do here if you knew the entire set of probability distributions would just be to keep playing the arm that gives you the highest average reward right that is the best thing you can do on an average right and so if you denote that particular uh, best possible average reward by mu max right so it's the best possible mu i over the all the arms i uh, some some 
omniscient agent that always pulls the time will accumulate t times mu max average reward in time t, right? Whereas you will accumulate something in time t. And you want to try and see if you can reduce this difference, right? So how, how, how well you can keep this difference small, right? Now this, the great notion is different from what you saw in the non-stochastic setting because now you have a set of distributions that parameterize the system. So you can talk of something called the best arm, which doesn't change with time, okay? So that's an important distinction. You could be interested in something different, slightly different. So for instance, you could keep playing arms adaptively or actions adaptively. And at the end of the end of the entire horizon, you could probably be uh, asking the question, which arm do I think is the best, right? So I just have to guess one of these arms at the end of the entire procedure. And uh, suppose I guess, I guess that arm number 80 is the best arm at the end of T rounds. I want to try and uh, minimize the probability that I make, an, make a mistake in that guess. Okay, so you just asked for one guess at the end of the horizon. Do whatever you want during the horizon. And I just want to find out which, whichever, which, which, whichever is the best possible action. Right? So this is relevant in settings where you have some budget of time slots to experiment uh, on the system. So this even occurs uh, in online advertising settings where some initial sort of exploratory time that you can spend in probing for options. And at the end of the day, sort of at the end of the time horizon, you basically decide which is the best option and then in the future you will just stick to that. Okay? So it's slightly different than trying to maximize your reward or minimize your regret. <coughs> is, is, it, is it clear? There could be other more complicated performance objectives uh, from this procedure. You might uh, not be for, you might for instance not just be interested in maximizing your expected reward, but you might also be interested in maximizing your expected reward subject to uh, controlling the variation in, in, in whatever rewards you get. Right? So, uh, so suppose you are an investor in the stock market you would be sensitive to some amount of risk. So you want to try and maximize the average reward while still keeping the risk or the, or the, or the variance of the rewards low. Okay, so you want to try and get high expected reward, but at the same time, you don't want to also increase your variance that uh, you know, reward at some time will uh, drastically dip. Okay, so these problems can also be formulated using various uh, performance measures. But again, to keep things uh, consistent, we'll again try and consider the problem of regret minimization in, in the stochastic uh, mandate setting. Okay? or it's analog, it's, it's equivalent to basically maximizing the total reward you can collect, expected reward, okay. So that again, uh, so regret in, in that sense uh, has a nice motivation to just being equivalent to maximizing your total uh, return that you collect, okay, <coughs> over the entire horizon of time, right. So a bunch of areas essentially, so this is, so the, the stochastic multi mandate essentially is a problem of uh, resolving the trade-off between exploration and exploitation, right? Uh, so if you don't explore enough across all the options that you have, you might fail to discover an option that performs well, okay? Because you have only uh, information about the action that you chose. Unless you explore, you will not find out how other alternatives look, right? Whereas if you explore too much, you will not be good at exploiting the information that you have. If you explore too much, you might explore across bad options a lot, and that might essentially hurt you in the sense of collecting a lot of reward. So there's an inherent trade-off there, right? It's a trade-off between collecting information and also optimizing simultaneously. Right? So, which is why it shows up in a lot of domains. Uh, clinical trials and gambling were sort of old uh, or classical applications. Uh, nowadays, have a lot of uh, problems in the online uh, uh, advertising or uh, news news uh, news placement uh, domains, which fit very well as multi-arm bandits. And uh, it, it has uh, sort of broad connections to noisy function optimization and so on. Maybe I'll talk about, talk about it a bit later. Right, so recommender system, you've already seen this. <coughs> so comment scoring, so uh, <coughs> I believe uh, reddit.com actually tries and uses uh, bandit algorithms to try and score comments. So if you've gone to Reddit, uh, it's basically a discussion site where people post something and then other people keep posting comments, uh, perhaps like uh, you've seen on Facebook. And uh, if you actually go to uh, a page, it has the uh, option of trying to decide which options, which comments are likely to be most relevant to a user. So it can actually change the order of comments that are shown to you, uh, hoping that you would like or read some of those comments. Right? So the ordering of the comments is dynamically decided. And you can, in fact, use variants of multi-arm bandit algorithms to, to formalize this problem. So what would be the arms in this case? Ah, so the arms in this case, so if you if you just uh, assume sort of let's say only one slot, you can only show one comment, then it's a simple multi-arm bandit where the set of comments available is the, is the set of actions available. Like if you think of more, 
complicated uh, allocation settings like you have you can show let's say a bunch of ads or a bunch of comments together then you can model it either as each slot being sort of a separate independent bandit or you can model uh, essentially a searching through the space of every decision will become essentially a ranked order of some number of documents or, or, or comments. So these things become a little complicated but you can still think of them as bandits because after all a bandit essentially requires you to think of several alternatives and a response to each alternative. So the set of the space of alternatives can be fairly complicated like the set of all rankings or set of all orderings on a set or so on. Right? What uh, we are talking about is a simple version of the multi amp bandit where you can play one action at a time and then observe a response for it. Okay. Right, so there is this inherent explore versus exploit trade off here. And uh, with some thought, you can easily convince yourself that being greedy is uh, absolutely the worst thing to do. Okay. So uh, you could say, look, uh, I just start playing the game uh, randomly and uh, uh, sooner or later I will just try and stick to the, I will just maintain a running average of all the rewards that I get from each arm individually and I will just compute a running average, right. So I want to try and maximize the uh, expected reward that I get from an arm that I pull. So I will just maintain a running estimate of its reward, right. So you know that the sample mean is a good approximation to the actual expectation. So I will just maintain a running estimate and this after a while I will just stick to the arm that looks the best in that sense, right. It is a reasonable way to start thinking about this. Uh, or some of us, but this uh, this doesn't work uh, at all in the sense of trying to minimize regret. So why is this? So just consider a simple uh, bandit problem with only two actions. Okay, so they are both uh, Bernoulli distributions. One has a success rate probability of 0.4, the other one has a success probability of 0.2. Right. So obviously you want to try and play the arm with uh, 0.4 much more often. Ideally you would like to play it always, right? But you have to learn about it. It doesn't come for free. So let's say you just start arbitrarily at time 1, you play arm number 1, right? you are unlucky and you get reward 0 for it, right? it is just a random outcome. right? Let's say at time 2, you play, let's say I decide to play uh, both arms in sequence for the first two time slots and then stick to the arm which gives you the best reward. You can do this for even some finite number of time, that's, that's okay. So if you play arm 2, let's say you get a reward of 1, you are you're again sort of, uh, you are super lucky there and you get a reward of 1. Okay? So after this essentially your view of the bandit is biased because you have collected some samples and you are in a sort of <coughs> some particular unlucky situation and this happens with a decent probability. This, this sequence of events can actually happen with probability 0.6 here times uh, 0.6 here times 0.2 right which is 12 percent. So with 12 percent of the time you are always going to get stuck in this case. And after this the running mean of arm 1 is 0 because you get gotten only one sample 0. The running mean of this arm is 1. So if you decide to go with arm number 2, you will always play arm number 2 afterwards. So being greedy right from the start is, is bad. Okay? So you will at least get regret that scales as you will always keep playing the bad arm afterwards and you will accumulate regret at a constant rate. Right? So why is this happening? Right? This happening because you are not aware, I mean you are not uh, being cognizant about random statistical fluctuations right? in, in, in your rewards. You have to somehow account for that. Otherwise you are going to get stuck or, or in, this is uh, in some sense analogous to the uh, phenomenon of overfitting. Right? So if you just uh, place too much trust in your data, you might overfit and sort of go with the wrong choice. In this case it is really bad because you actually end up, uh, you end up uh, getting very high regret whereas you want to try and keep it. Uh, sublinear okay so is it even possible is the question right so of course it, it is indeed possible based on what we've seen earlier we can just pretend that we can ignore the stochastic part of this entire model and pretend that this is a, a sequence of losses generated in some arbitrary way we can run the exp3 algorithm and so on and we can of course get lean regret that is something like square root t or something right so we know that these things are possible but is there a way to uh, exploit much more this probabilistic, probabilistic structure in the rewards and do much better. So this leads to, uh, yeah, so there has been a long line of work studying this uh, multi arm bandit problem, the stochastic multi arm bandit problem. There are several strategies that attempt to get around this problem of uh, sort of overfitting and uh, getting into bad spots uh, by some clever way of exploring across arms. Okay? Uh, yeah, you can find these references on the internet. 
but uh, probably the most classic and well known algorithm uh, uh, simple algorithm for playing the bandit uh, and and giving uh, an almost optimal uh, uh, rate of regret is this uh, very well known algorithm called the upper confidence bond algorithm right so it's also popularly called ucb so it came out, came around as late as 2002 uh, but it is really uh, something that is simple yet uh, basically does the job for you okay so what's the idea behind this okay so remember that we got into a bad spot earlier uh, because we essentially were not cognizant about the fluctuation of the estimates that we had right so in this case uh, we need to account for the fact that you've actually sampled arm 1 and 2 basically very few times is likely to be a high variation in these rewards right so how do you reason about these things okay so in a, in a basic sense let's say uh, you toss a coin okay so you have a coin with uh, unknown probability of heads and you're trying to learn about you're trying to estimate the probability that it is heads okay so suppose you toss it some k number of times right and you write down all the rewards right you get one when the coin is heads and zero when the coin is tails and you get heads 75 percent of the time okay so what would be an estimate for the uh, uh, the, the bias of the coin right? it would be 0.75 naturally because it's uh, an unbiased estimate of your actual uh, reward but you also have to be aware uh, of how much confidence you can put in that time it is 75 percent right so what is the typical range in which can you say something more about the range in which the actual bias might lie around the point uh, 75% okay right so anyone know what's the rough range uh, if you toss k times with what uh, sort of what interval can you put this true bias in around 75 as a function of k right so naturally if you if you take more and more samples if k is really large you will be very very confident about the 0.75 right you will say that it doesn't deviate it cannot deviate by more uh, too much from 0.75 no it's not allowed yeah so it's 1 by root k exactly so this is because of i mean one way to think about this is by something called the central limit theorem that all of you must have seen right so typically if i toss a coin uh, roughly k number of times and i observe uh, that the the running mean is something with reasonable confidence, I can actually tell you that it is going to be at 0.75 plus minus 1 over square root k. Okay, the square root turns out to be the right uh, sort of confidence interval that you can uh, bracket the actual uh, answer, your guess. Okay, so if you essentially guessed that uh, the true uh, bias is in the range of 0.75 minus k to 0.75, sorry, 0.75 plus minus 1 over square root k you would be actually this guess would this claim would actually be correct with very very high probability okay you would be this would actually be a very very reasonable guess okay rather than just saying it is exactly 0.75 okay is that clear so with this in mind what ucb does is as follows okay so it uses this this idea combined with another idea called being optimistic under uncertainty which is probably also a general principle for most of us in life okay so uh, so you're working with these n arms right at each time uh, point in time let's say you've played this game up to some point in time and you have built these running estimates for each the, the the reward the average reward of each action okay so i call it call mu i hat so mu one hat mu two hat mu three hat as the running estimate of a particular arm mu i uh, i okay so what you do is essentially uh, you write down all these sample means okay and don't just play greedily with respect to that you try and add this extra amount of bias which is something like one over square root number of times you've played the arm okay so you know that each arm's uh, actual reward uh, lies in an interval of plus minus one over square root the number of times you've played it uh, around each corresponding point right so what it is you you put all these intervals you write down all these intervals and just pretend that you have the most optimistic setting right so each arm's expected reward is actually at the highest possible uh, plausible value okay so you add this this width okay so forget about the two log t it is a technical term that helps to sort of add just the right amount of constant or, or additional amount of uh, confidence to to make things work but essentially you add an, uh, a small bias term of size one over square root number of times you've played a particular action to account for the uncertainty right so if you played a particular arm a lot of times this bias term that you add will be small right i mean arguably so 
hopefully. <laughs> so you will not essentially end up distorting the true estimate. But you don't want to distort the estimate when you play a large number of times. So it all, it, it's, it's all consistent with the reasoning, right? So uh, when you have uncertainty, just try and be optimistic. Assume that each arm has the best possible mean. And now you can try and play greedily with respect to this. Just select the best possible arm that maximizes this sum of two terms, which is called the UCB index of the particular arm. So instead of maximizing, instead of playing according to highest possible sample average, you just play according to highest possible UCB. Okay, at the current point in time. Then you play an arm, you get its reward, update all the UCBs and so on. Right? So this is an iterative process. Okay? <coughs> right? Uh, so, just, so this is just a small tweak, you add an artificial bias. Uh, to account for the variability. So this is in the, this is in fact very closely connected to the idea of bias variance tra uh, trade-off, right? So if you don't add this, there is too much variance in your estimates and that causes things to fail as we have seen. Whereas if you add this controlled bias, then it helps to reduce uh, the variance uh, at, the, at, at the right uh, amount of uh, exploration. So this gives essentially the possibility to explore arms that have not been explored enough. Uh, but just the right amount of exploration so that regret is controlled. And, and how much regret can we get? We in fact uh, can show that UCP gets expected reward of this much. So if you just subtract this term away, the regret is of order n log. So this delta is basically a problem dependent constant, right? It delta essentially represents the gap between the highest possible reward and the second highest possible reward right? in, in, in on average. Right? So delta is just something called the gap. But the takeaway from here is that this algorithm actually, actually gets you regret which is number of time, number of actions times log t. It's not even square root t. Okay, so it's able to use or exploit the statistical nature of the rewards much better, right? <coughs> right, so and, and it grows at a really small rate with time, which is essentially logarithmic with t, right? So it's almost like a constant. If t is large, it doesn't matter. Log t is quite small. Okay, the only thing, I mean, which is potentially worrisome is a dependence on the number of actions but this cannot be avoided in general you have to actually explore some action every action at least a few number of times right so this is inevitable but this is the best possible in terms of uh, how uh, you can control this uh, regret performance with time with uh, the total number of rounds which is in this case is small t okay right so perhaps i will show you uh, in a few lines why this why this works really right so Right, so uh, the UCP proof is actually uh, fairly simple to follow. I'll try and give you an approximate version, version of this proof, at least which has all the ideas, uh, but some of the technicalities may not be exactly correct. I'll, I'll point it out to you, okay? So, uh, okay, so, <coughs> so why should this, so why should a rule like this, <coughs> right, so why should a rule like this try and, uh, reduce the regret okay so let's start by so let's draw so you have n arms okay let's assume that all these arms have bernoulli rewards right so we are trying to build an estimate for uh, the bernoulli parameter of each arm which is the the mean reward okay so this is arm number 1 its parameter can be any, anywhere from 0 to 1 okay this is arm number 2 okay so this is arm 1 Right, so why does addition of this kind of term help you drastically? The reason is as follows, okay, so these are all the arms that you have. Without loss of generality, just assume that arm 1 is really the best possible arm. So, right, so its average reward is the highest somewhere, right. So, let me write down the average rewards uh, as in, so arm number 1, let's say has a reward distribution that is Bernoulli with parameter uh, mu 1, okay. So, this is the highest possible. Let's say arm number 2 has something smaller. and so on, right? Let's say arm number n has the smallest possible, right? So in reality, you would like to actually play arm number one all the time. So let's see how UCP tries and sort of figures out how this happens and at the same time controls the regret, okay? Uh, so is this clear? This is sort of the, uh, so at each point in time, uh, your, uh, your algorithm will basically maintain a running average, which can be anywhere here. It will be a fluctuating average, right? Because of statistical fluctuations, right? So let, let me note those as circles. So this is mu1 hat. Let's say this is mu2 hat. 
and let's say this is mu n hat, right? They can be anywhere, but we know that they are they are essentially sample averages from the corresponding distribution, right? So if you take large enough samples from every arm, these two two will be close enough, okay? And how close enough exactly is a subject of uh, we'll be discussing now, okay? So uh, <coughs> okay, maybe I'll just take this space. Right, so let's try and uh, let's let's try and tell how close mu one and mu one hat can be, or mu two and mu two hat can be. Okay, so uh, I don't know, maybe some of you have seen this before. Uh, Purushottam will also be talking about this probably tomorrow. But there's a nice uh, controlling the deviations of sample averages from their from their averages. Okay, this is called Hovding's inequality. Okay, so what does Hovding's inequality say? Right, Hovding's inequality says that if you have a sequence of independent and indi identically distributed random variables, x1, x2, up to xn, <coughs> right? So these are independent, each of these is an independent sample coming from the same distribution, right? You have n samples, let's say these are coin tosses, right? Uh, and uh, you know that let's say each xi is bounded absolutely by 1 and you also know that the expected value of uh, all the xi's are 0, okay? Think of this each xi as uh, the outcome from a sample uh, uh, from a coin toss minus its actual mean, okay? So, so that each each uh, random variable is 0 on an average and there are independent samples, right? Then it just says that the probability that if you form the sample mean of all these, right? So what's the sample mean? It's 1 over n times the sum, right? Right? The probability that this will actually exceed, so ideally what should this be? This will be close to 0 because the mean is really 0, right? So this mean is zero. As you take larger and larger number of samples, you should see this sort of being close to the mean, right? So the probability that this is something which is larger than some number c cannot be too large. Okay, it cannot be too large. How large can that be? It has to be something like e raised to minus n c square by two. Okay, so this gives you uh, an estimate for how far the uh, sample mean can deviate uh, by some number c. Okay, so c, let's say c is a positive number. Okay, so c, if c is really large, then this number is really small, right? So this essentially controls the probability with which things can go wrong, right? The probability by which your sample average can be very far from zero. Zero is here as as implicitly as a minus zero, right? Is this clear? Right? Maybe you'll see this tomorrow in Purushottam's talk. It's it's a very uh, basic and very powerful and useful inequality uh, in, in several of these analysis involving uh, sample averages and so on, okay? So let's, let's assume that, so, uh, <coughs> right, so this is mu1, right? So mu1 essentially recall is the best, uh, the best possible uh, expected value of any arm and you have mu1 hat here, right? So you can use this kind of thing to try and bound how far mu1 hat can be below mu1. Okay, so this I should mention that this also goes the other way around. It also, this is the deviation in the positive side. The deviation in the negative side will also have the same probability. It's symmetric. Okay, so let's try and bound the probability that uh, mu one hat and mu one are mu one hat dips very much below mu one. It cannot happen, right? Too much. So let's bound this in terms of Hovding's inequality. Right? So. <coughs> So in particular, yeah, let's bound the probability that mu1 hat falls below right, so I'll put this term here, okay. K1 is the number of times I have played the arm uh, one up to uh, up to certain time t. Okay. 
No, I want to, so in this for, for arm number one, I'm going to do the lower sided deviation. For all the other arms which are bad, I'm going to do the upper sided deviation. You'll see why this is happening, right? So in, in I mean, so, so mu1 is essentially really uh, 1 over k times, k1 times the summation of samples, k1 samples, right, of the reward of arm1, right? Uh, and if you basically take the mu1 inside each sample, you'll see that this is exactly like one of these x1s. Okay, which has mean 0. Right? So think of, <coughs> so this really has mean 0 and you control the probability that, I'm sorry, it should be minus, I'm really sorry. Okay, okay let's analyze that this is less than this negative number. Okay, so I'm putting a gap of minus square root, so this, this gap is basically minus square root uh, 2 log t divided by k1. I'm analyzing the probability that mu1 hat falls below mu1 minus this much gap, okay, at time t, right? So this should be by Hovnin's inequality, right? So two times number of samples collected, which is in this case k1, times the square of that number c there, right? This is basically the c, c for us, right? So if you square this, sorry, uh, by two, right? Sorry, not not two times, half times. Right? And if I just square this number here, it's designed uh, to be such that okay. So the probability that your uh, mu one hat actually dips below this level at time t is no more than one over t. Okay. So this term, so you'll see why this term is designed in this way. Okay, it's designed this way such that with probability one over t, with probability so with probability at least 1 minus 1 over t, you are in good shape. That is mu1 hat minus mu1 is greater than this, right? So if you take this to the other side, the UCB of arm1, is higher than mu1, okay? Or rather, I can just write it as mu1 hat is larger than mu1 minus square root 2 log t over k1. Right? So, with a reasonable probability, which is 1 minus 1 over t, let's come back to this figure now. Okay? So, this is mu1. With a reasonable probability, you are above this line here. Okay? This is essentially square root 2 log t over k1 and let's say there is some other arm mu2 let's say right so mu2 is lying here somewhere right you can use the same technique here to show that mu2 hat will not be more than some number above mu2 okay so you, you can say that mu2 lies essentially in this range mu2 hat right you know that mu1 hat uh, lies in this range it cannot be too far from mu1 on the negative side mu2 hat cannot be too far from mu2 on the positive side just by virtue of those uh, bounds and essentially you can show that after a certain interval of time, after time becomes large enough, these two segments will never intersect. Okay, because as time grows large enough, uh, if you set the value of time to be large enough, you can show that these two uh, intervals uh, never intersect. That means you will always essentially uh, start choosing arm number one, right? And that essentially leads to this bound here. You will not make uh, sort of mistakes more than uh, uh, in log t over delta times. Okay. That's the reasoning behind this. Right, so this is a very simple uh, uh, sort of in some sense the multi -arm, the basic multi-arm bandit is, 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 is a rather uh, simple and stylized way to model uh, uh, an explore exploit trade-off. You can have many more complicated uh, reward or action models here, right? So the standard assumption implicitly being made in the stochastic multi-arm bandit is that all the arms have to be learned individually, right? You cannot learn anything about a particular arm unless you actually go and sample it, right? So in some sense, the arms do not share any structure that allows you to generalize across arms. So you cannot, for instance, hope to learn something about a particular arm and use that knowledge to try and infer something about another arm so that you can save some more samples, right? So, but, but however, this is something that crops up in many uh, sequential uh, learning problems. 
there is much more structure or coupling across the arm space, the space of all arms, right? So, uh, <coughs> I'll give you an example, okay? Uh, <coughs> right, so suppose you have a bunch of arms, banded arms, uh, with this particular concrete structure of rewards. So, each arm actually, you know that it is associated with some parameter in d-dimensional space, okay? So, each arm is not just uh, an arm, but it is actually associated you also have information that this arm sits in some, some part of uh, d-dimensional space, right? So each associate with each arm a vector xi, which is known in advance, okay? Think of xi as features, okay? So arms might actually be uh, advertisements or news articles or news feeds having certain features. So, so suppose someone has already learnt and given you features, okay? And uh, the reward that you get while playing, uh, if you decide to play arm i, is basically its feature vector, inner product with a certain unknown vector that we will call psi and uh, some noise added to it, right? zero mean noise. So this is essentially a linear, it's saying that the reward from every uh, arm fits a linear model, okay? The parameter of which you don't know in advance, right? Uh, so, so noise is uh, assumed to be let's say Gaussian noise or right? small amount of zero mean noise. But uh, the key thing here to notice is that this essentially couples all the arms rewards together. You cannot have, uh, you, you need not actually go and actually learn uh, each arms reward individually. It's enough if you just somehow build a reasonable estimate of psi, right? This vector psi. This in some sense help you, helps you generalize across arms even when you have a really large number of arms. Because in some sense what you implicitly need to uh, learn about the system is somehow this vector psi. Then you can actually apply it to any possible even new arms that you get and try and estimate, have a good estimate for the rewards. Okay, so how do you try and uh, uh, design more efficient or more faster uh, online learning algorithm that can exploit such structure? Okay, so for instance, this linear, so learning this linear structure helps you generalize across arms. Okay, and so in, in, in that way, you can probably hope to figure out or reduce your regret in a faster way. Okay, is that clear? Right, so online learning with this generalization structure is something that is uh, very uh, uh, actively studied area and different uh, researchers consider, uh, identify uh, often different kinds of structure in these banded problems which might typically have a large number of decisions to be made but ideally which are parameterized by uh, an inter a small intrinsic dimension right in this case uh, d could be small but the number of arms could be really large right so you don't want something you just don't want to play a standard bandit algorithm that gives you something which is which scales as n but you can hope to reduce it to something like d Okay, and we'll actually see that this is the case. Okay. Right, so, uh, yeah, you can think of, uh, so several uh, uh, online settings fit this uh, paradigm of linear models. It's not something that I just made up. Uh, so for instance, you can actually uh, think of a problem uh, called uh, online uh, shortest path routing, right, which is a sequential decision making problem. Uh, as uh, being being uh, written down as a linear banded problem. So this problem is called linear bandits. So let's say you have a problem where you have to make a decision of a path in a network to follow, right, from source to destination, right? And whenever you pick a path, you basically get uh, as, as reward the sum of, or the sum of all the costs incurred along edges of the path, okay? So that can be modeled, so every arm can be modeled as an entire path, uh, which is essentially sitting in uh, d-dimensional space where d is the number of edges in the graph. And when you select a path, it basically, you can think of it as being encoded by a vector that has ones wherever you have paths and zeros wherever you don't have paths. And the reward that you get is simply the inner product of that vector with the vector that contains the actual cost of every edge on the network, okay? So you can parameterize it in this way as a linear bandit. You can, in general, cast more uh, complicated problems where you can, uh, you have to select a bunch of uh, subsets of, of a universe, a set of uh, uh, universal arms as, as uh, in this linear bandit, where each point will just represent what subset you choose, right? So you can represent subset choices as, as vectors where, with one zero entries, and you can uh, cast many uh, problems in this fashion, okay? And the parameter psi in this case will just represent the cost or reward or utility per edge or per item of this universe, okay? So that when you take an inner product of the indicator vectors with the parameter, you will exactly recover the sum of the subset that you've chosen, okay? So subset sum problems can be modeled in this way. And uh, a nice uh, generalization that uh, works here is uh, the UCB algorithm again, right? So recall that in the UCB algorithm, 
uh, that, that we saw. It basically goes and builds estimates of running estimates of every possible action using just the rewards that were gained by observing that particular action, right? It just uses that information in isolation to build its estimates and then go, go across all the arms, right? Whereas in this case, really the, the unknown parameter here is really the, uh, the hidden or latent variable psi, okay? So I in some sense, if you actually were to try and figure out with high probability where this point psi lies in the whole space of d-dimensional vectors, then you would have at least a good handle about how to use this side to predict the rewards of every possible arm that you that you're interested in, right? So really, uh, UCB uh, can be generalized to work here by building uh, an estimate and a confidence set, not across every individual arm, but in fact for this hidden uh, variable side. Okay, so uh, so the the point estimate of psi at each time turns out to be the uh, least squares estimate that you would ideally build when you have a linear regression problem. And uh, not, uh, not only this, we also saw that we need to build estimates of confidence around uh, point estimates, otherwise you will end up getting into bad spots. It's not good to just build a single estimate and then play the best arm corresponding to that, right? So uh, you can design an, a clever ellipsoid around it, a region in space that depending on the samples you've observed uh, so far, uh, confines the true uh, parameter psi to a, to a region around this psi hat with high probability. Okay, and this can be, there are geometry constructions uh, available for these. <coughs> and now what you do is, now that you have bracketed the set of all possible parameters for the system in, in some region of space, you be optimistic under this uncertainty. So what, the, what does that mean? So you have to finally pick an arm to play at every time, right? So suppose you have this confidence set, go to every point in the set, okay? So go, go to every possible candidate parameter psi in the set. If you go to a psi, ask it what is the best possible action uh, for that particular psi and what reward does it actually give me, okay? And find the parameter psi in this whole set which gives you the best possible or most optimistic okay, and this play the best action possible for that. So this is how you can be optimistic when you have un uncertainty, okay? And it turns out that uh, if you just play the most optimistic looking arm with respect to this ellipsoidal confidence set, <coughs> you in fact get regret that very goes as uh, something like d times square rooting instead of n times square rooting. So this is very useful when uh, you, you have a model that says, uh, look at uh, the reward that I gain from basically showing you an item with a uh, few number of features is accurately modeled by a linear function on, on only those features, okay? So there can be infinitely, there, there can even be infinitely many m's. There can be huge numbers of items, but as long as the feature dimension is small, uh, you can actually learn at, at rate proportional to the feature dimension instead of the number of arms, right? And this is exactly happening because by implicitly learning the feature map, you are able to generalize across actions, okay? Right, so you can take this even uh, further. You can actually deal with uh, uh, different ways of trying to generalize across arms. So this is a common variant called the x arm banded problem, okay? So, uh, X just stands for any possible sort of arbitrary decision space. So imagine that your set of arms is the uncountable set of points in 0 to 1, okay? That is each point in the interval 0 to 1 indexes an arm, okay? And when you pick a particular arm to play, you can pick any possible arm in 0 to 1, the set of all real numbers in 0 to 1 to play. There's an infinite uh, number of them. When you play an arm, you basically get a reward that is some expected value plus some noise around it, right? So this blue curve here denotes the uh, let's say the expected value of arms uh, in the set of arms 0 to 1 and uh, we make the assumption that it's a fairly smooth function, right? So this captures the fact that nearby arms share similar rewards. This is another way to model uh, the ability to uh, have structure in the set of arms or to utilize some sort of smoothness property among different arms in space, okay? So these settings occur often when you for instance, this is a typical case of trying to maximize uh, a, no a function via noisy samples, right? So you can think of the blue function as uh, a function and whenever you sample, whenever you give it an x coordinate, it gives you a y coordinate with some noise error, okay? So, so it's about this point, right? So you pick some point, you get a reward, you pick some other point, you get a reward, right? You keep doing this and uh, you are supposed to basically minimize regret with respect to picking the best possible reward the highest possible point, right? So if you pick, it would be ideal to pick some point here, but uh, you have to essentially learn about this given that you are searching for, uh, you are searching over the space of smooth functions, right? 
It turns out uh, there are variants of UCB that even extend to these kinds of complicated uh, 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 set of sets of actions. Okay. Uh, but what is essentially helping you is that uh, some some form of smoothness helps, helps you generalize. So basically, if you learnt about the reward of a particular arm well enough, you don't need to sort of keep searching for arms around it. You already know have a good estimate of the the mean returns from arms around it. Okay. Right. So uh, the next part is is, is rather different. Uh, it's it's a very different way to approach this problem of uh, playing a stochastic bandit. We saw already that the UCB algorithm is something uh, fairly natural based on the idea of bracketing the uh, variance of uh, running estimates of arms and trying to use it in a nice way to basically get uh, very low regret. Okay? But there is a totally different approach that uh, was proposed in fact uh, several decades ago in the 1930s in fact. It was basically I guess the first bandit algorithm ever. Uh, but uh, uh, it, 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 it seemed to perform very well. It always performs uh, rather well in practice but nobody really knew how why it uh, works or there was no real proof of this 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 form uh, for why it really works well until in fact uh, maybe 3 or 4 years ago right so for a long uh, number of decades it was just used in practice by a lot of researchers uh, and it was popularly called thomson sampling or posterior sampling okay <laughs> so idea behind posterior sampling is 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 uh, fairly simple it's a totally alternative way to uh, uh, alternative way compared to UCB to try and approach a bandit problem. Okay. So recall that uh, you basically have n arms and you can play basically one arm at each time and then you can observe the reward. Right? Uh, so this is motivated more from a Bayesian perspective to uh, decision making problems. It's not exactly Bayesian uh, but, but it's, it's, it's a sort of fake or fictitious Bayesian approach. Okay? Right? So the, uh, the algorithm works as follows. Let's just consider that we have two arms to basically choose between at each point in time, right? So uh, if, if there are arms that, let's say, you assume that they come from a Bernoulli distribution, right? All that you uh, care about is what is the Bernoulli parameter for each arm. If you were to know that, then the problem would be solved, right? There would be nothing to learn. You just go and play the arm that has the maximum parameter, right? Or the maximum mean. So uh, a Bayesian in this sense is someone who will come and say, look, I, I don't know the means for these, I don't know the parameters for these arms a priori. So let me just pretend that there is a prior probability distribution on the parameters of these arms. Okay? So in particular I can choose my favorite distribution. Let us assume somehow that uh, nature is assigning a parameter to each arm by using a, a uniform probability distribution. Right? It could be uh, any other distribution but uniform is turns out to be good enough. Okay? So let us assume that you have a uniform distribution uh, for the, uh, uh, I mean in some sense nature chooses uh, a parameter for these two arms based on uniform distribution. This is the Bayesian, classic Bayesian assumption that everything in the world is drawn according to a probability distribution, okay? so including even the parameters for the, for the, for the rewards. Okay? So let us say it is uniform. Now what you do is you just randomly sample an entire parameter from this prior distribution. Okay? So just go ahead and sample one point in 0 to 1 uniformly and call it the mean parameter for arm 1. Right? And sample do the same thing for arm number two, and you have basically one sample for for each arm. Right? So in this case, this might be something like 0.8. This sample might look something like 0.2. Right? Now in this, just after sampling, you don't need to do anything else. Just pretend that they are actually the real parameters, and make a greedy decision. Okay? So in this case, what will happen is it will just decide to play arm number one. Okay? So after you play arm number one, you just play the best arm, assuming the sampled means are the true means. And once you get a sample from it, you can think of updating your prior probability distribution on the set of mean parameters for arm 1 to a posterior distribution. Right? This is by something called Bayes rule, which all of you have studied. Right? Bayes theorem just lets you update the prior probability that the arm's uh, parameter was, the probability that the arm's parameter lies in, in, in some interval here. Given that you observed a sample that was 0 or 1, whatever it is. Right? So you get a true sample and you can update this posterior uh, so it will update from uniform to something that is slightly different. Okay? And uh, the hope is that if you, if you accumulate enough samples, then this probability distribution will actually shrink towards the actual true parameter value. Okay? This is something that has been that is, uh, well known in, in Bayesian statistics. If you keep updating the prior to a posterior with increasing number of samples, 
you know that this will actually concentrate to something which sits exactly on the uh, it will converge to something which is close to the real parameter okay so you repeat now that you have finished one time instant you repeat this exactly for the next round okay you take another random sample hopefully this will be close to sort of the peak of this distribution and in this case uh, just by pure chance uh, algorithm 2 uh, sorry arm 2 happens to be larger in this case so you just decide to play arm number 2 for a change observe a sample and update its prior okay so now your belief about the parameter the, the means of both these arms has changed in this particular way okay and so this is the algorithm you just keep going forward right there is no uh, artificial bias you have to add and, and so on the moment you fix a prior everything is defined okay so your choice of prior is up to the designer but after that everything just follows basically Right, this is as simple as it looks, you might uh, wonder, uh, you know, why is this reasonable? Does it give you the right? So, of course, it's a randomized algorithm as opposed to UCB because it, it can do random things at each time depending on what samples it picks, right? Uh, it's in that way, it's very different from UCB and uh, you might always wonder, you know, why, uh, why, why should it even, even work? Why does it even work in practice? Uh, you're just seeming to do too many things at random, right? So, why should things uh, uh, sort of concentrate or tighten at the right rates and uh, try and uh, get you uh, some form of learning okay. <coughs> right so this was actually shown to be in fact not just well performing but optimal in the sense of regret I mean it can actually op uh, obtain the op optimal n log t type regret rates uh, uh, as recently as a few years ago okay uh, so of course uh, that will probably also tell you that one cannot even write down the proof on the board here it will require probably an hour or so to write it down so it's, it's, it's fairly involved it's not as simple as this uh, but it's really nice to know that such a simple and uh, what was what looked like a heuristic strategy actually has optimal regret guarantees okay right so you can you can uh, extend this in fact to uh, uh, much more structured settings like the linear banded setup that we considered okay so recall what happens in the linear banded setup uh, okay, so by now in the last, so, so after uh, the, the analysis for Thompson sampling came out, it's been found that it, it's actually very, uh, it's, it's a rather broad property that it enjoys, uh, corresponding to any kind of structure, <laughs> structured banded prediction problems. Okay. Uh, so, uh, for instance, in, in the linear banded case, uh, so recall the linear banded setting. So, right, so you pick an arm with some feature xi pick an arm i with feature xi and you get a reward that is a noisy version of uh, psi transpose xi right uh, where psi is a hidden parameter right uh, so so what you can do uh, for a linear bandit if you want to use this thompson sampling kind of approach is actually to put a prior distribution on uh, the uh, is to put a prior distribution probability distribution on the on the set of all possible psi so for instance you can start out by imagining that the, the unknown latent variable psi is actually distributed ac according to let's say a Gaussian distribution right in d-dimensional space right just start with some prior distribution uh, what you do is uh, just sample a possible value uh, for the latent parameter psi from your current posterior distribution in d-dimensional space now once you have sampled that pretend that it actually characterizes the entire model right then go and basically figure out the best arm uh, which will give you the best inner product with the particular uh, value mu hat that you've sampled. This is a proxy for phi, uh, psi, and just play that particular action. Okay, so not notation might be slightly different, but the idea is exactly the same. You have an uncertainty or, or prior distribution on psi. You pick a random sample, uh, play an action which attempts to maximize that sample, uh, ma optimal with respect to the sample, and once you observe uh, a reward, a noisy reward, you can update the Gaussian prior to a Gaussian posterior. Right, so this is the well-known uh, principle that if you have, uh, uh, if you if you know x, and if you have a Gaussian prior distribution for mu, and your observations are of the form x times mu plus noise, then the posterior distribution after you observed x times mu plus noise uh, is essentially still a Gaussian distribution. You can just update the mean and covariance. Okay, so this becomes really convenient because. You started with the Gaussian distribution as a prior, you continuing with the Gaussian distribution as a posterior. You don't need to maintain too many parameters other than the mean and the, and the covariance of the Gaussian uh, vector. And uh, this uh, somehow, I mean, this, this, this also 
uh, in a nice way converges and gives you optimal square root t, uh, d times square root t regret that you see in standard linear bandits. Right? So this is a powerful way to uh, implement, this is also very very efficient in terms of implementation because at each time you are essentially maintaining a Gaussian distribution which is essentially a mean vector and a covariance vector in, in d dimensions and it is rather easy to sample from a Gaussian. Okay? So it is not at all, uh, so you can implement it, in, uh, implement it in MATLAB with one line of code. Okay, so it doesn't matter even if the dimensionality d is large, you can easily sample from a Gaussian given a mean and a covariance. Right? And this turns out to be actually uh, practically a game changer in solving several linear bandit problems. Okay. <coughs> right, so, uh, so this is probably, so this is an example of uh, the, the online shortest paths uh, uh, decision making problem that I said could be cast as a bandit. So you have a network. Uh, with a source and a destination, right? So you have a fixed source and a fixed destination. Think of this as you want to go from home to office every day, okay? And each particular day you decide to choose a path. You choose an entire path. Uh, each path has some mean, let's say, cost associated to, to traversing that path. Let's say it could just be the amount of delay that you suffer along the path or the amount of congestion or pollution or whatever it is, right? So if you go along this particular path, the reward that you get will be uh, sorry, the cost that you suffer will be this cost plus this cost plus that cost plus that cost. Okay, so it's an additive cost model, which which uh, is reasonable in several settings. So the model is you choose an entire path, you essentially have realizations of rewards along the path, and finally you essentially observe the uh, not reward, I should say cost. Uh, okay, you would probably so you can you can have different uh, feedback models in one f one model uh, your, the cost that you might observe might actually be the accumulated sum of cost that is the sum it's a sum function in another uh, in in other settings for instance if you're interested in flow type problems your reward actually might be essentially the bottleneck path along this route in which case it might correspond to a min function okay so if uh, xt of ij is uh, the stochastic capacity of link ij right the capacity of this path essentially becomes the most bottleneck, the capacity of the most bottleneck link on this path, right? So this is essentially the least possible capacity in, in an entire path, right? So supposing you have reward feedback, uh, which is of this particular form, right? So essentially observe your actions here are essentially the set of paths in the network. And uh, each path in the network, when you select the path, you get basically a reward that is some complicated function of the atomic or individual rewards that comprise the path. Okay, so this can arise in several settings. Uh, it need not be exactly a linear function. So this is going away from the linear bandit setting into more, much more nastier forms of feedback. Okay, so you continue playing this game. The feedback, the only feedback you get essentially is the min of all these things. You don't know, you don't even know any of these other uh, variables on the path. Otherwise, you could learn much more. But uh, you are only given information about the min of these uh, random variables. So every time you select a path, you get to see the minimum of the random variables that comprise the path. <coughs> So how can you hope to learn this, such a setting? The reward is not linear. You can't resort to uh, a linear model of the uh, reward as a function of the uh, paths that you selected and so on. Right? But you still wanted, interested in minimizing the re regret with respect to, let's say, the best possible path in the network. Okay. Right. So more generally, you can come up with uh, an entire class of bandit problems, which we call complex bandit problems, right? where you have a basic multi-arm bandit with n actions and different probability distributions uh, and you have a bunch of derived actions corresponding to these actions right so in the shortest path routing case each action you can think of each of these basic actions as each edge in the network okay and each complex action is an entire path so it's it's a section of certain edges on the network okay so you have these derived actions uh, your basic essential basic actions are essentially the distributions of every cost on every edge of the path but uh, each action is a much more complicated combinatorial object okay and you can pick only complex actions and whenever you pick a complex action to play you get some reward which is a noisy version of uh, some function of the basic variables that comprise the, the complex action okay so the online shortest path setting fits into this as do several more settings so for instance uh, you could be dealing with a simple subset selection problem uh, in bandits where you, you, you're not allowed to just play one arm of a bandit, but you can decide to play, let's say, five arms of a bandit at each time, right? Uh, think of these as, let's say, advertisements just for the purpose of, purpose of example. And if you decide to put five ad advertisements on a page, the net value or utility of that collection might not just be the sum of all these. It, it might be a complicated model for the rewards that you get 
uh, or the utility that the user gains by showing different types of ads together. Right? For instance, certain combinations of ads uh, which have similar categories might not give you the same reward as much as other combinations of ads. So you might have in, uh, something like a submodular function on, on, on the uh, reward that you get by showing a collection. Okay? Uh, you might have some max or min type feedback. So essentially the feedback that you get after showing a subset is some complicated function of each of the rewards of the items in the subset. Okay? And it's a very aggregate form of reward because you are not even allow, uh, allowing access to observing individual rewards of elements in the subset, but it's some aggregate function of all those. Okay. Right? So uh, there's an example from job scheduling where uh, the reward function turns out to be something popularly called as the make span. Right? So the make span essentially is if you split a set of jobs across a bunch of machines, uh, the make span is basically the, the time taken by the last machine to finish uh, all jobs. Okay? And that turns out to be a very non-linear function of the individual finish times of all jobs. Okay? Right? So you might be interested in sort of minimizing functions of this type, uh, which are in, the, in turn derived functions of more basic uh, uh, rewards. And you can actually extend the, the fundamental idea of Thompson sampling, sampling even to these settings, right? So what you do is, all that you have to do is some nice way of putting a probability, a prior probability distribution on each of these basic parameters or basic reward distributions. After which, so think of this entire circle as the set of all possible basic parameters, right? All possible basic reward distributions. You put a prior probability on that set itself, right? So every point here corresponds to specifying the distributions of all these arms and that in turn completely induces the distributions of rewards for all these complex actions via this function. Okay? So you just you can just sample a random parameter from here. Once you've sampled the parameter, <coughs> right? So this is the true parameter, right? Which you have to discover. Suppose you sampled some parameter here from the prior. Assuming that that is actually true, you can try and compute the best possible complex action that you can play. Right? And this turns out often to be a simple combinatorial uh, algorithmic problem in networks like let's say finding the shortest path in a network given all the edges weights or uh, something uh, like uh, sorting a vector okay which is polynomial type once you've done that and played the best action for the sampled parameter you can so assuming that you can go back and update the posterior distribution uh, over the space you can hope to do this iteratively and converge in some sense to the actual parameter and in the process minimize regret and it turns out actually that this is right, so this is just in uh, notation the entire algorithm that is exactly what we went through and you can actually show that uh, I mean uh, with, with, with some uh, careful uh, um, analysis that if you start with a reasonably nice prior uh, and uh, you have a bunch of actions and even if you are working with a model with, which has very complicated reward feedback you can actually control the regret in a very nice sense in the sense as uh, uh, some constant times log t where in fact the constant now need not be uh, the set of all possible complex actions, right? So in fact the set of all possible complex actions might be really large. So think of the set of uh, all possible paths in a network. It could be exponentially large in the size of the network, network, right? So you want to avoid a dependence on the total number of complex or derived actions and you want to in fact have a dependence which is closer to the real sort of unknown number of variables, which in this case might be the number of edges in a network or uh, the number of elements in a set uh, from which you are picking subsets. Right? The set of possible subsets might be exponentially large. But you really don't want, uh, you don't want to ignore the structure and sort of learn each subset as, as if it were its own. Because you know that all the rewards are coupled. Okay? And uh, you can actually show uh, that this analysis captures the C constant as uh, something that is related to the inherent description length of the problem in the sense that it essentially uh, specifies the number of in independent dimensions. So this is like the D in the linear minded problem where uh, D is really the number of degrees of freedom in terms of the unknown parameter. Okay? It can be uh, in, in some cases that we looked at much smaller than the number of actions and uh, it has an interpretation as the solution of a particular optimization problem. Okay? So this is uh, uh, satisfying in some sense because it helps us understand why Thompson sampling works in, in f with far more generality than just the simple multi arm bandit which has been well studied and it can actually uh, have the potential to generalize across actions by assuming uh, some form of structure uh, in the model of, of, of rewards from actions. Okay? So I guess I'll stop here. You, I just mentioned that uh, 
this goes even beyond banded problems. You can use Thomson sampling to solve reinforcement learning problems where you have states and actions, not just actions. So basically when you play an action, right, so you have three different states for instance. You are at this state, when you play an action, you just don't get a reward, but you actually also go to a different state, right. So now you have to be aware of actions that might not just give you bad rewards, but might take you into different kinds of states where you might sort of be forced to pay penalties for a long time, right. So this forces, uh, in some sense, this is a, even a much harder problem than the bandit, which had only one state, so to speak, with several actions, where you have to actually be cognizant of how future states will evolve depending on what you do uh, today, okay. And you can actually uh, uh, show that Thomson sampling works well uh, if you have a parameterization, parameterized version of an entire reinforcement learning problem. Uh, and you can use it in the same way as you did for bandits to draw parameters. Uh, except that if you draw a parameter, you have to actually compute the optimal policy for the uh, Markov decision process uh, as opposed to just playing the right, uh, the best possible action, right. So it's just a small change in definition, but the basic prescription remains the same. And uh, it turns out to actually uh, work fairly well, right. So you can actually prove regret bounds and stuff, okay, which depend on uh, essentially something that inherently is the dimensionality of the of the of the reinforcement learning problem that you're considering. Okay, so so I guess yeah, this is all I had to say. Uh, uh, so this wraps up sort of the bandit setting. Okay,